Well, good morning. This week we get to the kind of the postlude. Maybe you would call it the post credit scene for Jesus, the one and only. And we're in um, this really interesting section which tells us the story of these two guys. One we know the name of, Cleopas, and the other guy we don't know the name of. Um, and these two guys are obviously followers of Jesus, but they're bit players, right? You know, just, you know, unnamed actor number three, you know, um, smiling guard number four, things like that. Um, they're bit players, but yet they appear in one of the most powerful and important passages really in all of Scripture. This Emmaus moment has spurned, well, movements in and of itself, has sparked people to, um, to seek Jesus. Why is it so powerful? Why is it even so important? Well, let's not miss what was happening here. These guys had been with Jesus, seen Jesus, walked with Jesus, and yet they didn't recognize him. They were followers of Jesus. I imagine as if I asked you to raise your hand in here and you said, are you a follower of Jesus? Y'all would say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, right? You've been going to church all your life. Maybe you've been going to Sunday school all your life. Maybe, maybe you remember Cookie and Kool-Aid Sunday from Vacation Bible School in the 70s and 80s, right? Yeah, and they'd give you those little bitty cookies. Uh, we had a lady in my home church. They'd give you these little bitty cookies. And on Wednesday of Vacation Bible School, you'd get these coconut cookies. Yeah, everybody was there on that day. And I always asked for extra because I was the little pudgy boy. Can I have, until they start just slipping me an extra one or three. Maybe you've been part of Jesus and he's been part of you for a long time. But these guys have been following Jesus at least for a fairly significant amount of time because they are still followers of his. They're still connected to Peter, James, and John. And before this, there was this big falling away. A, pe a lot of people abandoned Jesus. And then he's taken captive and he's killed. And, and there's a lot of folks just kind of go, zoop, right? Like in your life, maybe you've experienced this, that you have tons of friends when, when you're cool or things are good or things are happy or things are going well or... But when trouble comes, maybe you got something bad happening in your life, there's some tough things going on, those friends kind of evaporate. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Sometimes in this world it happens. I mean, you, you can tell who your friends are when the going gets rough, right? And so these guys had to have been pretty committed followers of Jesus. They, they knew about the, the vision that the women saw of that morning, right? That Jesus was raised, talked to the angels, the, the whole Mary Magdalene story, um, Raboni, that, that whole story. They saw him. And so they knew that story. And they knew that Simon Peter had run to the tomb, right? But didn't see him, right? So... Um, They were at least in that fairly inner circle. But they, the Scripture says that they were prevented. They were prevented from recognizing Him. God prevented them from recognizing Him. The Holy Spirit was blocking their vision. Now, why? Why would the Holy Spirit block their vision? Why would the Holy Spirit do those things? Why would it keep them? Because I think sometimes 
It's the eye-opening moments that make the most difference. It's about timing. Okay, husbands. I want you to think back to when you proposed to your lovely brides. Right? Timing had to be right, right? You know, you had to do it in the right way, the right time, right? And if they don't get it right, it, you know, right? Timing is important. How many of you have ever given somebody a really big present and you had to wait for a big reveal? You know, you know, I, you know what I always wanted in my life? This, I've always wanted this to happen to me. I wanted somebody to give me a car, and I wanted the big red bow on it. <laughs> Except I want a 1968 Chevelle. You know what I'm talking about? With a big engine? Mm -hmm. With a big red bow on it. Right? It's the reveal, right? TV shows get it, right? You have the big reveals. Like when I was growing up, what was the big reveal? Who shot JR? Right? Right? And then the next big reveal on Dallas was Patrick Duffy walking out. It's all been a dream. Y'all remember that? And people were all mad, right? It's the big reveal. You got to hit that timing, right? And for y'all that don't remember Dallas, you didn't miss much. It's okay. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to offend any Dallas fans there. Um, the reveal in any production is important. And why is that? I think it is because it gives us the buildup and then the background. Jesus knew that if he, these guys knew him and recognized him, they would be so focused on that, they wouldn't hear the message. See, they'd be more focused on the messenger than the message. You ever see that happen? You ever see that with TV preachers? Right? They would get more focused on the messenger than the message. Or maybe cults of personalities in churches, right? Where we're following the preacher, not the message. Right? Um... Jesus needed him and the other guy, Cleopas and, and the other guy, uh, the unnamed actor number two. And us too, to hear the message. Those guys needed to hear the story of the whole Old Testament explained to them. Of how Jesus was who he was and who he was and how it was supposed to be. He took him to Scripture. And after the fact, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? I mean, just burn within us? Okay, they're not talking about heartburn, right? Okay? They're talking about that when the Word of God hits us, it lights us on fire. It's, there's something like, have you ever heard something so good that you could hardly contain yourself? Okay, grandparents. Grandparents, y'all listen to me. Do y'all remember what it felt like when your beloved children showed you a picture of your first grandbaby with the ultrasound? Did you lose your mind? Yes. Right? Right? It's, it's important. That buildup, and sometimes news just burns within us and we always will remember it jesus needed them to remember this right i don't know who these two guys were i don't we don't hear about cleopas again but he's obviously involved he obviously stays involved did he help write some of the new testament maybe maybe he was a scribe maybe he talked to peter and that's why peter wrote his book the way he did maybe he talked to james and explained all this to james and james wrote the book of james the way he did maybe him and paul got in an argument at some point and that's why paul wrote the way he, they you understand that sh iron sharpens iron and jesus needed these guys to understand this but they're not heralded. Some of the most important people in the kingdom of God never get a book named after them, never get on YouTube and all this famous stuff, and they never 
up here. They're the folks that hear the stories and know the stories and tell the stories. It's, it's us. It's me and you. I am actor, unnamed actor number three. <laughs> and you might be unnamed actor number four. And it's okay. Because it's for the glory of the kingdom. The very word of God, the message of God, the good news, the, the euangelion, that's a Greek word that means good news. Euangelion. That word, the gospel, is, um, is something that resides in us. It's life-altering. It's path-altering. It changes us. It makes us different. You can't come in contact with it without being changed. You can't. You just, you, just, you just can't. And you'll either close your ears and walk on, or you'll sit down and eat with him. Right? You just, you, it's like, okay, so I was dipping in a bucket to get some chlorine. Y- y'all know the chlorine, that powder chlorine you put and you pull? And I was dipping in, and I got a whoof. Of it. Y'all know what a whoof is? I breathed it in. And I was not the same the rest of that day. You know what I mean? I was like, whoo, whoo. Sinuses opened up. Everything was running. Eyes watering. It just was gross. It's not good. Right? I mean, just not good. Yeah, it was just, I just, it was not good. I have, um, I have a, I have one encounter that I remember with a missionary. When I was in seminary. And to hear his and his wife's stories and connect with them was never the same. I've been in Africa, Russia, Central and uh, Central Me- Mexico, Central Mexico, and Central America, and um, I've encountered people and their stories that have changed me forever. But nothing has changed me more than my encounter with Jesus at twelve years old sitting in the choir loft in the youth choir cuz I was sitting on the back row next to um a guy named Brad and I was singing uh baritone they yes they let me sing in the choir and um brother Sal Lilly was preaching the revival and it was youth night And we were singing a little song called um, uh, That Little Country Church. And it went something like, I was driving down the valley with my radio on, trying hard to change my dismal state of mind, when I heard some gospel music from a little country church where the folks were really coming alive, and then you go into a medley of gospel songs. It's kind of cool. I still remember it. Because I remember sitting there and hearing Brother Sale preach and realizing that I was a sinner. Realizing that I was a sinner. Right? Because sometimes we get real arrogant about who we are, and sometimes we get arrogant about our position in Christ. But I, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I've been in church all my life, but it hit, it hit me like a ton of bricks that I was indeed a sinner, and if I died that night, I would go to hell. Just hit me. Hurt my heart. It humbled me. Because I was pretty arrogant. I was pretty proud. I wasn't proud of my looks. I wasn't proud because I was popular or all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there there were some things that I had real pride of. And God humbled me. And I went to the altar and I gave my heart to Jesus. And... And you would think that that would be it, right? 
right? You think, okay, well, you know, click the box, done, but no. Over and over through my life, God keeps humbling me. Over and over, he keeps challenging my pride. Over and over, he keeps pushing me to eliminate sin from my life, right? To eliminate things that keep me away from him, to, to pull me towards the person he wants me to be. Amen. Because I'm not yet the person he wants me to be. But thank God I'm closer than I was yesterday. Amen. I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. Those two men that encountered Jesus were changed. I have no doubt about it. Because you can't have a face-to-face -face encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ and not be changed. It's interesting to me that today is Holy Communion. And Jesus revealed himself to them in the breaking of the bread. I'm a high church Methodist. I like all the high church stuff. I can do all other kinds. I, I love a praise and worship service as long as it plays 1990s praise and worship music. A little DC Talk, a little Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant, Sandy Patty. Ooh, that dated me. But something powerful about the Eucharist. There's something powerful about Holy Communion. There's something powerful about the words, this is my body. This is my blood. You see, Christ, even to today, reveals himself in the Eucharistic feast in symbolic and powerful and manifest ways. It's mystery. It's drama. It's story. Because we always tell the story. It's the story of the kingdom of God writ large on human history. It is so much more than we are ourselves. But yet we get to participate. So today I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, not because there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing, but I, I just don't normally say it. But I want to invite you to a feast. I want to invite you to walk that road this morning. I want to invite you to sit down and break bread with Jesus. You know, when you have somebody over to eat, it kind of means you, you got to be peaceable with them. You know, in the Holy Land and in many of the tribal cultures, if somebody was in your house or in your tent eating, that you had to protect them? They were your responsibility? And you had to treat them better than family? It's called the law of hospitality. Well, you're coming to God's table today. Come and feast at his banquet. Sit with him and be at peace with him. Meet Jesus at a different way today in the breaking of his body and the pouring out of his blood for you so that you and I might be redeemed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.